Hello, this is Daniel Denver, your host of The Dig. I'm here to tell you that I'm still not done with my book, All American Nativism, How the Bipartisan War on Immigrants Explains Politics as We Know It. And it really, really needs to be done with. My partner, Dig Senior Advisor Theoria Frankos, has been remarkably tolerant, even as I, her partner, have become strange, messy, nocturnal, and rather useless. And so in the spirit of getting this book done and getting things back to normal, we're doing something we've never done before, but that people have assured me is really quite all right. We are taking a week off for the first time ever since we started the show on December 6th, 2016. And instead, we're posting this classic from deep in our archives. Aziz Rana on his book, The Two Faces of American Freedom, a.k.a. Episode 62. Oh, and before I hand this off to the certainly somewhat less capable Daniel Denver of circa October 2017, I want to alert you to some fundraising news. As you know, this podcast exists because you, our listeners, support us with your money at patreon.com slash the dig. And those of you who contribute at least $10 a month get a book from us as a thank you. And I wanted to tell you that we have a new book on offer, Capital City, Gentrification in the Real Estate State by Sam Stein. So now you can choose Stein's amazing book, which I recently interviewed him about, or you can choose Feminism for the 99%, Mistaken Identity, or The ABCs of Socialism when you sign up to support us at patreon.com slash the dig. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash the dig. Capital City is a really stellar book. Okay, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled programming next week, and I've got lots of good stuff in store. For now, here's the very first interview I did with Aziz Rana from October 31st, 2017. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. As I feel like I've been touching on quite a lot recently, it's odd that people consider Donald Trump such an aberration from the norm in a country that was defined from settlement, slavery, and revolution through Western expansion and Indian removal to Chinese exclusion and the National Origins Quota Act by white settler colonialist empire. We like to think of slavery and native genocide as heirs made in our country's long, preordained, and redemptive march to a more perfect union. Trump upsets that fiction. My guest today is Aziz Rana, a professor of law at Cornell Law School. He is the author of a 2010 book called The Two Faces of American Freedom, and it's a book that I found extraordinarily useful for thinking through the American past and present and also for thinking through my own book project. Rana is currently working on a book on the 20th century politics of constitutional veneration and how that has shaped the terms of domestic and foreign affairs. In Two Faces, Rana argues that we must reckon with the settler empire context that has defined this country from the get-go. But importantly, it's not a pessimistic account. Rather, it's a dialectical one. He makes the case that freedom for insiders has been premised on exclusion and oppression of outsiders, but that the ensuing contradictions have long created openings for radical challenges to the settler empire orthodoxy. And that holds out the possibility of remaking American freedom into something truly universal. Before we get started, we are now accepting not only listener questions, but also listener comments. So, if you'd like to get in on that, please support us with five bucks a month or more on patreon.com slash the dig. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. <laughs> 
If you like the show, hook us up and help us reach our goal of 700 supporters by year's end. Also, if you already support the show, please call in a comment or question. We love to hear from listeners. And finally, before we get started, I wanted to mention another interview I've scheduled for later this fall. Karen and Barbara Fields for a discussion of their book, Racecraft. It should be a really good one. Okay, on to the show. Aziz Rana, welcome to The Dig. Thank you uh, so much for having me. The Two Faces of American Freedom is a big, beautifully written and complicated book. Your argument is, if I got it right, that white settler colonialism, which you say is better thought of as settler empire, is really the fundamental starting point and ongoing context for the American project. So let's start by laying out the the historical facts at the beginning. Yeah. So I think the first thing to appreciate is that the Anglo colonists that came sometimes by force, sometimes by choice, to North America really were carrying a radicalized version of Republican ideas that had been emerging in the 17th century in England. In particular, this was a thought that in order to be truly free, you had to have control over all of the important decisions in your life, economic decisions, political decisions, spiritual ones. So when it comes to economics, this meant that you had to be economically independent. You had to make the most important decisions about your work life, the kind of production you gauged in. And in particular, because this is a kind of agricultural society, you had to control land and own land. So you had to have independent proprietorship, homesteads, to be able to ensure that you're actually somebody that's not dependent on another one's financial will. And when it comes to politics, you had to be a participant in ongoing discussions and deliberations. And this was a fairly radical account of what freedom and freedom as self-rule really required. But it carried with it certain profound limitations, because there's also the sense that, well, wait a second, in order to be able to own land, there had to be land that's available. And in order to be able to be somebody that was in control of your own labor and making choices, you had to be someone that's not subject to harsh or degraded forms of work that might be just sort of a necessary feature of what it means to be part of an agricultural society. And so what early Americans did to solve this problem was on the one hand to defend practices of general expansion, which amounted to native expropriation. You need native land in order to be able to enjoy the benefits of being free. And you also then needed to have people that would engage in the hard or degraded forms of work that might be necessary for society, but that would make you unfree. And that was a problem that was over time solved through lifetime bondage for persons of African descent. And those two features of society became really foundational. They're kind of like the intrinsic political and sociological conditions for what you might think of as a fairly egalitarian and robust um, form of political life. And that's the two faces of the title. On the one hand, you have very rich internal accounts of what it means to be free. But in order for that to actually get off the ground, it's constitutively bound to native expropriation, a project of continuous territorial expansion and dependent and violently imposed control of um, enslaved persons that are doing the hard work. You write that this settler colonialism, which was so central to the American project, remains essentially hidden in collective consciousness. When did Americans decide to start pretending that our country is not settler colonialists? Like, at what point were they able to look at something like South Africa and not recognize a uh, familiarity? Yeah, so that's a great question. If we were having this conversation 100 years ago or in the early 20th century, what I just described would actually be pretty familiar. A racially circumscribed community committed to rich internal accounts of equality and freedom out of necessity bound to territorial expansion, 
and to the control of dependent groups like enslaved African persons or African persons suffering under Jim Crow. In fact, many Americans in the late 19th, early 20th century thought of themselves as like part of like a community of sibling settler societies like uh, in South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, you name it. And in fact, that's actually how somebody like Teddy Roosevelt really thought of the U.S. It's noteworthy when Japan defeats Russia in 1904-1905 at war. There's a lot of fear in Australia and New Zealand about, well, what does this mean for like the rise of Asian power? What, what does it mean for the future of white control over these territories? And Roosevelt sends part of the Pacific fleet on a tour of Australia and New Zealand to say, just like the U.S., we recognize that New Zealand and Australia are white man's countries. And for that reason, we have an ethical and cultural commitment to preserving them as white men's countries. When is it that Americans decide that they're sort of innocent of these, I guess, original sins? So I think there are really two decisive moments. The first moment is taking place during the same time that I was describing Roosevelt, which is like the late 19th, early 20th century. And what's happening then is that the U.S. finds itself really on the global stage for the first time in a sustained way, particularly in the wake of the Spanish-American War that leads to the U.S. uh, forcibly annexing Puerto Rico and the Philippines. You're already seeing incipient forms of non-white political assertiveness among people that are colonized and those that are resisting colonization. And American elites have to start thinking about, well, how do we justify our presence places like the Philippines or in Puerto Rico or what we're doing in China and the Caribbean through gunboat diplomacy. And the argument that increasingly emerges is one that takes on board some of the radical elements of kind of anti-slavery, civil war and reconstruction discourse. This is a thought that, you know, what defines the U.S. are the principles of the Declaration of Independence and that the country is committed to universal equality for all, and its institutions are organized through self-government. But what's key is that that gets used not as a language for fundamentally reforming the internal institutions of the country, but instead for kind of justifying white American global supervision. So so at that point, there is a shift from embracing the purpose of empire as being white supremacy to it being about something more noble and and universal? So take the Philippines. The U.S. immediately faces intense guerrilla combat on the ground because Filipinos don't want to be subject to American imperial authority. And just as a condition of being able to maintain order, what American administrators end up doing is giving some degree of mediated self-rule. And then there's a question, which is, if as just a condition of being present, you have to give over some condition of self-rule, like what is the U.S. doing there at all? And the argument is, well, actually what American power is about is creating a global community of free, self-governing Republican states. But the reason why the U.S. has to be present is because Americans have a kind of cultural background in knowing how self-government works. And so non-white peoples require American tutelage. And it's this way that the language of self-government becomes used basically as a way of justifying ongoing white control that we can think of as a brand of white supremacy. And that justifies American interventionism, rule, and tutelage over communities abroad. And interestingly at home, this is a key language to justify Jim Crow practices. This is like one of the many competitor views in the early 20th century. It's not the dominant view. It's, if if anything, it's a kind of minority view held by those that are strong proponents of a kind of interventionist foreign policy. So the Wilsons of the world, elements within the Republican Party. It becomes a much more general position during World War II in the confrontation with Nazi Germany and the kind of explicit racial ideology of the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And then during the Cold War, where what had been like one strand of thinking about the U.S. now is the explanation for why the U.S. alone should be the global superpower and why its version of the modern project of how 
kind of equality and the state can be fused together is the one that should be replicated globally. And the American model is the only legitimate model. It seems like the starting place for this story that Americans come to tell about themselves in many ways begins with the revolution, which is understood as this anti-colonial uprising against colonial abuses. You write, I think, that it was actually the increasing racialization of the colonial political economy that helped lay the groundwork for the revolution, along with shifts in the organization of the British Empire, shifts that were actually making the British Empire more pluralistic in some ways. Describe how the revolution came about and what was actually at stake, and then how that's been misremembered. Yeah. So in the late 18th and through the 19th century, there was clearly an argument about like what made the U.S. distinctive. And the thought was what made the U.S. distinctive was a kind of internal democratic and class equality that among Anglo and settlers of European descent, everybody is basically treated equally. But even if there's this thing that made the project exceptional, it was actually continuous with Europe's various imperial projects. The United States was a European outpost in the non-European world. And I think that fact is really important in being able to make sense of how it is that the settlers understood the reasons for revolution in the first place. The argument that I make is that conceptually, it's actually probably better to think of the American Revolution as something much more like a, a settler revolt against the imperial center, London, than you know, a post-colonial project of independence by an indigenous people. This is because really what the focus of the disagreement centered around was growing concerns that settlers on the ground, like their capacity to pursue territorial expansion, to expropriate native lands, their ability to control the terms of lifetime bondage for those of African descent, that those things were being challenged and they were being challenged by the imperial center. In a way, what was happening was that Britain's empire was expanding globally. So Britain all of a sudden, following 1763, now has a massive new Quebecois French Canadian population. It has an emerging empire in India, in Bengal. And the administrators at home are trying to think of ways to order this empire. And they're doing so by navigating the competing interests of different constituencies. And for the colonists, they understand themselves as we alone are free British subjects, and that these other communities, they're not subjects. They're our dependents. And efforts to limit the ability of settlers on the ground to claim native land or ways of interfering with the slaveholding rights, these are direct attacks on the freedom and independence of the legitimate subjects of the crown. And settlers actually describe it as reducing them to a condition of slavery. That's, that's a term that they invoke time and again. Absolutely. What they were saying effectively is, we are free subjects. We are members of the community, not enslaved persons and certainly not native peoples. And the kind of policies that England's pursuing is treating us as if we're the equivalent of native persons or enslaved persons. In a sense... What the U.S. is the first example of is a kind of restlessness among a settler population vis-a-vis the home country in a sense that basically the settler population has a more radical or extreme account of their own internal equality and therefore a more xenophobic relationship to those they view as outsiders than what you're seeing at home. There are all sorts of really interesting historical parallels. There's a similar story that goes back to the latter part of the 19th century in Algeria where you had the Pied Noir, the French settlers in Algeria, Mm -hmm. that at one point are really pressing in a serious way to think about independence from France so that they can have greater control over the local community. What keeps them from doing that is that they're a minority population vis-a-vis indigenous Algerians, and they need the French army to maintain their position. That's not what's the case in North America. In North America, 
the colonists didn't require the British army in order to be able to maintain their position on the ground. And the lack of military necessity as a kind of binding economic links makes the push for settler revolt much more plausible. In fact, things like the Stamp Act are raising money to pay for British troops to keep settlers from crossing a line upon which the British said you cannot cross into Indian country beyond this line, which infuriated both poor backcountry settlers who wanted land and also wealthy land speculators like George Washington. Absolutely. In school, like in social studies, you hear all about like no taxation without representation, but you don't really get a sense of like why that had an intense experience on the ground. And the reason was taxes were being raised to ensure that there was a British military presence to keep settlers from claiming land they believed was their birthright. And that's a really intense experience. Folks like Washington are ignoring it. They're like engaging in fraudulent land practices and like taking land and getting illegal sales anyway. And so then in the 1770s, they give it over to French Canadians that are Catholic. And that's also infuriating because so much of this era is organized around very strong Protestant principles that like Catholicism is a religion that's like fundamentally unfree because you pay obedience to a pope. And they just defeated the French in the French and Indian War. And then the British are turning around and being like, actually, these are now subjects in the British Empire and we're going to let them speak their language and worship the pope. And Exactly. Whatever. Now you're giving the land to people that we think of as enemies and incapable of being assimilated into a free society rather than to your rightful subjects. So all of these things are coming together to produce this moment of revolt. Basically what happens is there's a significant English court case in 1772 called the Somerset case. And what Lord Mansfield, the judge, concludes in the Somerset case is that there is no basis in English common law for chattel slavery. And so it means that if somebody from Virginia or Jamaica brings with them an enslaved person to London, they can't rely on the common law to protect their slaveholding interests if that enslaved person were to choose to leave. And in the context of all of this, it's read as a real indictment of the idea that if you're in Virginia, you're actually treated as somebody that's the same as an English subject in England. And there are a couple things that are influencing this. One is there's already all of these fears within Anglo settlers about race war and the possibility of domestic insurrection. And there's also the sense that basically England's increasingly treating the colonies as if they're the equivalent of just like conquered land, where maybe a Virginia slaveholder gets to have their slaveholding rights in Virginia, but they're not really English, quote unquote. And then this, of course, gets intensified because one of the first things that England does during the revolution, Lord Dunmore, arms enslaved persons to fight against the Virginia colonists. Which is precisely their worst nightmare. Exactly. All of these things put together create a context where settlers see themselves under intense threat and they understand the act of asserting independence as a war not just against the British metropole that's become corrupt, forgotten its commitment to internal freedom, but as a way of suppressing the possibility of domestic slave insurrections and dealing with the concerns about indigenous people. The parts of the Declaration of Independence that we never read include a long list of grievances. And as part of those grievances, Jefferson notes that England promoted domestic slave insurrections and also brought to the American like border native peoples as political enemies that could attack the United States. So those are central to how settlers were imagining why you needed to go to war. I want to talk a little more about slavery and something you touched on a little bit ago, which is that I think it's often remembered as a system that was rooted in racism, but you and others have argued that, in fact, it was racism that was rooted in slavery and that slavery served critical purposes for the colonial and later the Southern American ruling class. The first thing that should be said is that this issue of you have an agricultural society and there's going to have to be hard, degraded forms of work done. It was like a widespread view. 
And it was one that in the earliest days of colonization wasn't necessarily racialized in the way that it came to be later on. You had long-standing practices in England of indentured white servitude. You had people that were brought to the U.S., children kidnapped from city squares and brought to the U.S. as indentured servants. And the very earliest African enslaved persons that came over in the mid-17th century, especially when there was a need for more labor, were also oftentimes treated as indentured servants. So in other words, they served for some period of time, and then after that period of time, they were freed and had the capacity to own property. In various places had voting rights, had a status not all that different to the status of white indentured servants that had also been freed. And this meant that in parts of the 17th century, there were really interesting kind of interracial relationships between white and black workers based on the fact that they shared very similar economic experiences. And there were even, you know, real histories of intermarriage, et cetera. In fact, the very first miscegenation laws, anti-miscegenation laws in Maryland in the 1660s have a really interesting quality. They don't say, you know, whites and blacks cannot marry. They say instead that if a free white woman marries an enslaved African man, that the woman and the child have the same legal status as the man. I mean, that, that's kind of a wild thought based on notions of Southern feminine purity, etc. What's key here is trying to protect the labor supply. As land is becoming more scarce, as there are greater class conflicts within settler society, you're starting to see interracial rebellions basically emerge against the existing economic order. And in many ways, the transformation of slaveholding into, for Africans alone, lifetime bondage, and the move of Africans, whether enslaved or not, from one segment within society into a, an excluded independent class, was part of a sustained effort to deal with these internal realities. The racial ideology that then emerges to justify the strict difference between whites and blacks both serves to preserve the labor supply for plantation owners, and it also serves to enhance white solidarity and so break up various kinds of class accounts. I mean, the reason why I think this is important is that today there's an extended conversation about how to think of white supremacy. And one of the ways of talking about white supremacy is to say that there's a constitutive anti-blackness that goes back to the very founding of the Western state, that it's just part of enlightenment. And it's a kind of perpetual, enduring feature. But one of the things that I think, let's say, the less skillful and complex versions of it tend to do is it tends to make it very difficult for us to see, well, how is it that regimes of racial management changed over time? Like, how is it that white supremacy as a regime of racial control was different in the 17th versus the 18th versus the 19th century between the kind of period of colonial settler expansion that I was describing and then the U.S.'s emergence out of the global stage in the early 20th century. And it also makes it really hard to see what ways it can be contested in the present. It's as if there's no spaces for cross-racial solidarity. But if instead you see a really complicated story of how economics and race were sort of implicated within one another and certain types of arguments about racial management emerged out of existing class and labor conditions, then you can also see, well, wait a second, this was about political struggle. There were actual sites of resistance, and those sites of resistance then shaped the terms of the racial politics that emerged. Now, this isn't to say that they're clearly deep-seated kind of racial and cultural judgments that are part of why it made sense to have lifetime bondage for Africans alone. But it is to say that if we don't pay attention to the material conditions and we just have this kind of permanent 500-year story of unchanging anti-blackness, we can't actually articulately either describe the past or think about what change in the present would look like. I think that's such an important point that these sort of primordialist accounts of racism seem to, to echo primordial or biological accounts of race. And both are things that we should steer away from if we both want to understand how history has unfolded and also to avoid any sort of 
sense that the state of affairs that we're currently living in is inevitable and permanent? Yeah, I mean, so this is an argument that does not contest that white supremacy has been a really constitutive feature of the American project, bound to the settler past, part of the troubled way in which settlerism participates in our own present. But it is to say that there are important spaces for kind of like alternative political self-conception that are kind of built in to the American project that we ignore if we think of white supremacy as just like one flat feature or like even one flat thing. And something that essentially lacks a historical context and lacks a political economic context. And another outcome of that, I think, is the sort of framing we hear from some people in the liberal establishment like Hillary Clinton last year, that things like economic exploitation on the one hand and racism on the other are sort of mutually exclusive problems or that dealing with one necessarily entails some kind of trade-off of not dealing with the other, which then I think, and you talk about this near the end of your book, leads to this emphasis on incorporating a small number of women and people of color into the ranks of the ruling class instead of thinking about how to transform power relations in a way that ends the ruling class. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, in a way, this might be a useful moment to talk about, well, how is it that as Americans came to reimagine their own past, especially in the mid-20th century with the rise of liberal nationalism and with the revolution being reconceived, how was slavery reconceived? And basically what happens is, not surprisingly against the backdrop of the fact that you have all of these anti-colonial movements in the global south, you have American policymakers at home saying, well, the revolution was an anti-imperial act when it's actually like much more complicated. It's like anti-imperial and rejecting Britain, but on behalf of a deeper commitment to settler control and expansion. Framing the revolution as anti-imperial then also reframes like the meaning of slavery. Like the story then is that, well, slavery is a kind of archaic racist practice that's out of step with American values and principles. And so what does it mean in the 20th century to take seriously the anti-imperial elements of the country's past. It means now sort of including African-Americans and other communities within liberal society. And that mostly means ensuring that elites from minority backgrounds have access to positions of power, that equal opportunity in some limited sense is provided. And this redemptive story is sort of the, the flip side of the pessimistic story we were just talking about. That's exactly the case. What it does is it ignores how the basic bedrock structure of the U.S. was organized through principles of subordination, control of labor and land. And that's something to this day, and certainly in the mid-20th century, just had not been addressed. And so even if you now have like a liberal ideology of including some people, that's a liberal ideology that's not dealing with the structural fact of economic and political dispossession. And that's the argument that many black radicals were making in the 1960s. And so for the liberal, like the Hillary Clinton liberal, it leads to the conclusion that since slavery really doesn't have to do with like the embedded structure of the society and that racism really isn't about the embedded structure of the society, that you can disconnect class domination and various forms of economic inequality from a commitment to racial progress. And it ends up producing a very limited account of what you can and should do in the present. So there's a weird way in which liberal optimism and at least this brand of very pessimistic radicalism ends up in a kind of similar location. I'm Naomi Klein. You're listening to The Dig as well you should be, and you can support them on Patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon and by Well, good question, who? You frequently hear ads right here from Verso, University of California Press, and N Plus One. We are now looking for new publishers to advertise with us. Do you write or work for a magazine or book publisher? If you do, can you think of any group of people more interested in buying smart left-wing books and magazines than Dig listeners? Because, well, 
I sure can't. If you want to advertise your media product on The Dig, email me at firstname, lastname at gmail.com. That's danieldenver at gmail.com. That is also, incidentally, where you may send me listener letters, which, as long as they are not intensely mean, I always do my best to respond to. Okay, thank you, and back to the show. Returning to the historical chronology, after the revolution, the idea of the frontier plays this really key organizing role in American political and economic life. How did the frontier function, both as an idea and as a thing that was happening on the ground in terms of territorial expansion? And how did that justify the project of settler colonialism while simultaneously obscuring it. The frontier was really experienced as liberating for poor settlers of European descent in a very real way. In other words, you have all of these internal class tension. The late 18th century is a period of kind of explosive revolts on the ground, the Shays Rebellion, the Whiskey Rebellion, where individuals are facing really profound forms of debt, losing their land, being sent to debtor's prison. And probably the thing that does the most as a safety valve is the fact that like, these folks can basically just move and claim new land. In the 1790s, the big thing that kind of alleviates some of the problems of the Whiskey Rebellion is a set of battles that essentially like, expropriates native land and opens up new land for Western settlement. In a way, that means that the frontier is actually really important as a continuous mechanism that protects and expands internal freedom. Later on, even as fewer and fewer people are actually, you know, moving to take new land, it's out there as this kind of ideal or ideology. And you can see it in Lincoln's sort of famous speech in Wisconsin, 1859, where, you know, Lincoln talks about how what makes the U.S. distinctive is that basically like everybody can be a free labor in the sense of like, owning property or being an artisan or having one's own shop. And that rests on the idea that anyone, if they want, can actually move out west and have new land. That's why when the frontier closes and the country becomes much more thoroughly industrialized, it's forced to face this basic question about, like, well, what happens when there's no new land to the ideal of economic independence? And it's why the late 19th century, through practices in the labor movement, the populists and the socialists, quite haltingly, obviously, starts in a sustained way to like think through this issue of, well, what would be the ways in which economic independence can be provided to a new worker and laboring population that can never actually have access to land in the way that might have been the case in the past? Because in, 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 in the late 19th century, with the closing of the frontier, it becomes increasingly clear to people that empire is not furthering ordinary white people's interests, but actually facilitating the rise of a new industrial order that is infringing on their freedom and pushing them into wage labor and off of their farms and and things of that sort. So it stops functioning as an escape valve. Absolutely. And it means that you now have more and more white settlers that are thinking that, wait a second, in order for me to actually enjoy real economic democracy, industrial democracy, this actually might require thinking of my own solidarity and allegiances as linked to communities that also find their labor oppressed, like African American sharecroppers. And it produces a significant moment of sort of extended self-reflection about, well, what would actually generate real freedom under these circumstances. In a way, expansion and conquest as a safety valve both in practice and in ideology had solidified white solidarity and had undermined the rise of class solidarity. I mean, this is one of the key ways in which empire, sort of like a background condition to limiting the possibilities of like radically transformative interracial alliances. And like the late 19th century is this interesting moment where you have white settlers coming 
through just an analysis of their own economic interests to start thinking about like, well, you know, what would it actually mean to be free and does it require breaking from some longstanding settler assumptions? I mean, the thing that's really noteworthy is that for these folks and the populace and the socialist party a little bit later, because it's kind of material interest that's bringing people together, you don't have the same kinds of arguments that explode among radical abolitionists and like the German socialists that were fighting in the Union Army in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, where you had some group of radical Republicans that were just articulating, like as an ethical matter, the centrality of a multiracial democracy. Um, that's not the argument that white settlers are making during this period. They're making a, an argument not about like the inherent necessity of a multiracial democracy. They're making an argument about economic interest. And I think, you know, it raises some really sort of like difficult and thorny questions about the relationship between class and solidarity that, you know, if we had just spent a whole bunch of time talking about like the limits of a kind of flat anti-blackness perspective require us to take very seriously more complex versions of those arguments. Because ultimately, I think you're, you're saying that the populist movement's sort of utilitarian approach to class solidarity left it ultimately vulnerable when it came to real questions about fighting racism and made it ultimately unable to withstand what became a really intensely racist backlash that included Chinese exclusion, mass xenophobia, the rise of Jim Crow, all of these things that the populist movement was providing an alternative to, but without really a rich account of interracial solidarity that extended beyond shared class interests? To me, this is maybe the great and tragic recurring feature of American politics. If you think about the 19th century in the U.S., and especially the story about the late 19th century, there are kind of two ways that poor white settlers on the ground could actually enjoy the benefits of real economic and political self-rule and democracy. One way, and I'd say that this way, it wasn't experienced in fact, it was a kind of like symbolic connection, is through the politics of empire, and that includes xenophobia. So like really harsh impositions about who counts as a member and who isn't a member and both native land expropriation, but even when that disappears, a rigid defense of white supremacy. And the other way was through an argument that, well, on class terms, it's actually the case that, for example, Chinese workers and African-American workers and white workers have the same material interests and so need to work together collaboratively. And at certain moments, I think of real political possibility in the U.S., but there's always this embedded tension. In a sense, it's a tension that's there in class as the condition of solidarity. Because on the one hand, you know, what is solidarity at the end of the day? But people coming to realize that they share interests together. And so it has to start from something that's, that's like everyday and material. But on the other hand, if it doesn't become something richer and more binding than just purely a kind of self-interest, then it's very easy under circumstances of external pressure, state violence, the kinds of crackdowns that took place in the, the 1890s and took place again, different moments in American history, for it to break down and for people to basically recede into the kind of long governing wisdom about race and, and ethnic composition as the side of, of, of solidarity and attachment. And that's actually, I think, really been you know, a profound and continuous struggle in the U.S. And maybe if you could just briefly break down what the populist movement was, how powerful it became, and, and how it fell apart, I think a lot of people might not realize that it did offer a pretty radical, anti-big business, anti-imperial, anti-racist form of politics well before I think most people think that that was something that could have happened in the United States. The U.S. had pockets of such sentiment from even earlier moments. So you see this with radical abolitionism. You see it with 
radical reconstruction efforts to think seriously about what it would mean to create a multiracial democracy built on economic independence and political participation for all. And then you see it with the populace, where basically what happens in the late 19th century is that the country is facing these rolling economic crises, like these various recessions that are effectively depressions. And local farmers on the ground that are white, especially in the South, but not just in the South, increasingly find that they no longer can get enough money from the crops that they sell to keep their land. And they're forced into greater and greater debt until they eventually lose their land and become farmers on land that they previously owned. And for some portion of these farmers, they start to recognize that, hey, wait a second, our situation is really not that different than the situation of African-American sharecroppers who have gone from a position of bondage to freedom back again effectively to bondage. And it generates a variety of different things. It generates, one, a massive national movement really built on the thought that in class terms, society should be organized to represent the interests of the many, and that this requires transforming the institutions of government into an effective voice for those that are poor and marginalized, and also a set of quite wide-ranging economic policies from shifts in monetary policy to make credits more widely available to transformations in the nature of how industrial manufacturing industrial laborers organized that really feed into follow-up social movements like the socialists. And so in, in the 1890s, you actually have a powerful populist movement in the south of all places saying that the system basically is dividing white against black for the rich man's benefit. And it's a movement that's strong enough that it's actually threatening the Democratic Party's hold on power. Absolutely. So the Democratic Party there's a moment in the U.S., even after Reconstruction, where it's conceivable that the Democratic Party is a party of the white slaveocracy and now white supremacy, might in fact disappear as the dominant party in the South. And the way that the populace end up getting pushed back is basically through straight-up electoral fraud, where they win elections, but they're not allowed to take office and the votes are stolen, and then through extensive forms of violence, violence in particular waged against African Americans. And this is where it starts to get really complicated because the populace and the Farmers Alliance, which is one of their central institutions, they had segregated membership frameworks. The Socialist Party, too, basically looked the other way while its own party affiliates in the South had segregated membership frameworks. And the argument that populists made to each other, so Tom Watson was one of the great kind of radical, egalitarian populist during this period, the argument he made to other white Georgians was, hey, I'm not talking about social equality. I'm not saying that you have to interact with African Americans. I'm just saying we share the same economic interests, and so we should vote together and participate in a single social movement to overthrow the planter class in the South. And there's a kind of power and beauty to this type of argument, because that's how solidarity emerges. But there's also a real limitation. This is not Thaddeus Stevens. So Thaddeus Stevens, a great radical Republican, when he dies, he's buried in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in a freedman cemetery. There's an inscription on his tombstone. You read that inscription. The inscription says that he lies there not out of like a random personal choice. I'm, I'm obviously paraphrasing. But because in death, he wanted to stand for the principles he fought for in life, equality of man before his creator. The reason why he was there was because no white cemetery was desegregated, and so he felt the only place he could be free was a freedman cemetery. That's not the politics of Tom Watson or of the populist movement. And it means that over time, as more elections are stolen, the African-American vote is suppressed, fewer and fewer African-Americans vote for populists because you know, understandably, like they don't necessarily trust white neighbors that just recently were fighting for the Confederacy and they're facing all of this violence from the Democratic Party that controls the state. You have more and more populists like Tom Watson himself that come to blame African Americans for the reasons why the populists fail and to retreat from a politics of class and economic solidarity. And Tom Watson in particular becomes a really just brazenly virulent bigot. He becomes a strong defender of lynching. He plays a central role in the lynching of Leo Frank, the Jewish man that was wrongly killed for uh, uh, the murder of a white woman factory hand. And at the end of his life, 
he is the face of the Democratic Party's white supremacist oligarchy, including in the Senate. Now, I tell this story, it's really important to be able to distinguish between two perspectives. So the one perspective that we've already sort of worked through is white supremacy is permanent from the Enlightenment. It means basically the same thing, and it produces a deep kind of pessimism that has its own sort of conservative implications. Another perspective is a kind of Pollyannish faith that class can somehow solve the problems of white supremacy and settler empire in the, in the U.S. And there's also this related, I think, quite troubling implication that you do get among some democratic socialists today, which is the way to ward off the evils of kind of Clintonian identity politics is to just embrace class as like the universal feature and class first. Now, those are two obvious caricatures. But I think the problems with each tell us that we have to be somewhere in a much more complicated middle ground because it is absolutely the truth that the way that in American past, large numbers of white Americans have signed up to projects of radical racial reform in the 1890s, certainly in the 1930s with the CIO, has been through arguments about shared class and material interests. I think that's absolutely central, continues to be central today. It's not for nothing that the contemporary labor movement is actually increasingly a space of extensive African-American and minority political voice. In some ways, it's easier for African-Americans to rise within the labor movement than within other comparable institutions of power. But at the same time, the structural features of the society, and in particular the way in which the society has long been organized through these specific colonial frameworks means material interest alone in the face of violence, resistance, state oppression has broken down in ways that have left those that were marginalized and dispossessed, like African-American workers in the South, incredibly suspicious of the politics of like well-meaning class. I think that's such an important point because it's even though racism is impossible to understand without a political economic context, it doesn't mean that that political economic context entirely determines the reality of racism or that racism can then be reduced solely through a political economic explanation. Absolutely. But what it does mean, and maybe this is another way of circling back to the Clinton point, is that it's really, really important that we refuse to divorce our conversations. In other words, there's this conversation about foreign policy, uh, and it's just about, do we like this intervention or that intervention? But it has nothing to do with what's happening here domestically. Domestic and the foreign, these are totally separate. Or here's a conversation about economic objectives. And we may disagree or not about regulations of like corporations, but that has nothing to do with our conversations about race. No. Actually thinking seriously about the nature of our own community requires understanding how all of these have actually been deeply stitched together. The foreign and the domestic are profoundly implicated in one another. You can't have an emancipatory economic policy at home while allowing the state to engage as a coercive, violent imperial entity backing corporate interests abroad. Like Those two things cannot be reconciled. Similarly, you can't have a politics of real racial emancipation that doesn't also transform the nature of the economic terms of the society. Those two things can't be separated. So it means basically holding together all of these and really being suspicious when you see actors attempting to distinguish, to say, well, you know what, let's just focus on the economic battles at home. Let's not worry about foreign policy. You know, the labor movement tried to do that in the Cold War period, and over time it destroyed the independent strength, I think, of the traditional labor movement. Or, hey, you know, let's just focus on affirmative action and liberal integration on race grounds, but like, let's not worry about like, the deeper economic turns. You know, we actually tried to do that too in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And the consequence in many ways was the rise of mass incarceration and the persistent structural fact of profound racial domination. These things can't be separated. Discussions about empire and political economy are often separated. Really, the question of empire today is not much addressed at all, unfortunately. You were just explaining why the two need to be 
addressed together. Can you explain a little bit historically about the analyses of, of empire abroad and political economic inequality at home, how they become separated and what sort of function the separation of those two things has? If we're back in the 1930s or, you know, the 1940s, the period before the Cold War, one of the things that would be really remarkable about labor politics and African-American freedom politics is the way in which domestic and foreign are really linked together. Labor movement conceives of its own community of solidarity as workers everywhere. African-Americans conceive of their community of solidarity as colonized and oppressed peoples of color everywhere. There's a clear recognition that what the U.S. does abroad is directly implicating the kinds of domestic policies that it has at home. And it's why both of these freedom struggles conceive of the centrality of having an independent foreign policy, one that's distinct from that of the state. Cold War circumstances end up breaking apart that frame. For the labor movement, one of the conditions of, I think, like the victory of labor bargaining rights is to transform the nature of the labor movement, to say, well, the labor movement isn't just like a general mass struggle for democracy. It's really about the bargaining position of employees vis-a-vis management. And so the unions in the 40s and 50s largely accede to the idea that they're going to give up on asserting managerial control and leave that as prerogatives of the business owner. And then they're basically going to fight over wage relations at like the local level of production. And at the same time, in order to ensure that the state stays on their side and is willing to enforce these collective bargaining agreements, they're going to refuse to engage in contesting American foreign policy. So accept an anti-communist position as well as anti-communist purges within the unions. And this whole bargain, I mean, I presented it in a way that's super kind of interest-driven, but it also gets kind of entrenched through a type of Cold War working class patriotism that comes to define the union movement. You know, these were these great victories. They're being preserved in the present through our participation as like we the people Americans whose primary attachment is to the U.S. and not necessarily to our own class. And a very similar story you can tell about the traditional civil rights movement where the success of the civil rights movement in the 60s, the legislative successes, are built on the idea that you accept the thought that what the U.S. is doing abroad is fighting for principles of equality, even if in practice it's actually backing South Africa and and undermining self-determination in places like Vietnam. And you argue that because what the U.S. does abroad is fight on behalf of all oppressed peoples everywhere, then it has to respect racial equality at home, and that the primary attachment or allegiance is to the U.S. as this universal nation, and so to the security state, and not necessarily the interests of other colonized peoples. Within both freedom struggles, but especially within the African-American freedom struggle in the, the 60s and 70s, you have a persistent undercurrent of disagreement. You can associate this with Malcolm X or with the Panthers or with other voices that basically say no this is actually ultimately going to be a kind of a hollow victory and that the terms of real emancipation require maintaining independence from the projects of the state and understanding that the foreign and the domestic have to be connected. But due to state suppression, due to a sense of the actual real material victories that people got through the civil rights achievements of the 60s, by the time we get to the new century, you know, the early days of the 21st century, that perspective also really recedes. One of the things that's really interesting to me about the last few years is really for the very first time in a half century, these arguments are kind of back. And you can certainly see in Black Lives Matter and their vision for black lives the refusal to distinguish between the domestic and the foreign, and their strong assertion of a set of left internationalist and emancipatory principles for foreign affairs. I want to return to the late 19th century, where there's sort of a a fork in the road with the populist movement heading in one direction, and this virulent anti-Chinese, anti-Catholic xenophobia, and reimposition of Jim Crow on the other path. And the reason this path opens up, as you mentioned, is because of the closing of the frontier and empire no longer serving ordinary white people's 
freedom, no longer guaranteeing them a sense of freedom. It seems like we're seeing something similar now with this breakdown in, for decades after World War II, as you said, American empire really allowing Americans to see their own freedom collectively in the U.S.'s global power, and that no longer really functioning anymore. It seems like in some sense that's the closing of a new frontier, and that Trumpism is one path in a new fork in the road. That's a really compelling way of presenting it. I mean, the way I would describe it is that the power of the labor movement politically in the context of the Depression to be able to sort of transform at least partially the Democratic Party and sort of impose a set of material gains for working people combined with the politics of the early Cold War really shaped the terms, a kind of a new bargain that marked the U.S. And it's the America that we tend to be familiar with that kind of combines the social welfare state, even if incomplete, with the politics of racial liberalism, broadly speaking. And by the time you get to the 90s, it's like if you grew up in the 90s, you just sort of think that, well, that is what America is. Like, that's just the nature of this country. And this is part of the idea of American exceptionalism. Like, that's just the country. When actually it was a really contingent bringing together of various political events and developments from the mid-20th century that persisted even after the Cold War ended. And in a way, what we're struggling with right now is the final breakdown of the type of Cold War politics and frame that sort of suppressed what had been the long antagonistic struggle in American life. Effectively, we're back in history. We're back engaged in that struggle. And to me, that's the significant point about the Trump victory. I mean, what I tend to be suspicious of are efforts to naturalize Trump's win. In other words, to sort of tell a story about like how Trump had to win. Trump had to win because there's a kind of constitutive whiteness that required as a response, for example, to Obama's victory that Trump be in office. And a very different argument, but made in similar circles and similar magazines, I think, is not the inevitability argument, but that he's a totally abnormal rupture with American yeah. politics, as they always have been. So, yeah. So you have these two arguments. One, he's inevitable. The other one, like he's this like evil that just doesn't compute or fit with America. And the problem I have with both is they both, in different ways, ignore the extent to which the American struggle has basically been about how to contest these features of the national project. And really, you can tell the story of 2016 as a story not of like the inevitability of Trump or like Trump is somehow wildly out of step with the long trajectory of American history, but as with a breakdown of the Cold War frame, you have again the possibility of like a radically socialist politics and the possibility of what had long suppressed that, which is a white ethno-nationalist framework built around a long history of settler conquest and subordination. So we're just back struggling with the same sets of questions, and that means that we have to engage with these as the various paths that the country faces now. And I think that's why your argument in your book is such an important one, because it's neither pessimistic nor optimistic. It's just not deterministic. Rather, there are these sets of contradictions that have been provisionally but never permanently resolved, typically through racism, xenophobia, and empire. And in the 1990s in the U.S., we saw this with the rise of mass incarceration and new nativist movement. But Ultimately, as people have said, uh, you can't eat racism. And they worked long enough to keep Bill Clinton in office for two terms, but they don't seem to be working forever. And part of what I think did help facilitate the rise of this latest version of white nationalist, xenophobic, ethno-nationalism is the long-term breakdown of organized class politics. You know, the union in the first half of the 20th century does something that's really profoundly important beyond just bargaining, which is it's a way of organizing people's identity and making sense of their own experience of oppression. And in a strange way, 
if the Cold War bargain was built on getting rid of that, the long-term effect was that it undermined the very Cold War bargain itself because once class identity and class politics disappears, then it's much, much easier for racial identity and a kind of white nationalist politics to rear its ugly head again. And then the other thing that's worth noting here is that I would want to add a third position to the two that we've already noted that I think we should be suspicious of, like one that naturalizes Trump, one that makes Trump exceptional. The third is to say that Trump equals populism. And this is the thought that comes up again and again, that like Trump is proof of this terrible paranoid style in American politics that just has to be suppressed. And whenever you have mass sentiment, it becomes extreme and destructive. And it's that perspective, by the way, that I think also undergirds a kind of liberal centrist presentation of the quote unquote alt-right and the quote unquote alt-left as equivalent. It's like, my God, they're these extreme views that all have to be contested. And of Sanders and Trump as equivalent exactly. on some level. Instead, I think we have to really think seriously about, well, wait a second, like not all populisms are made the same. In other words, mass democratic social movements and political efforts in the U.S. have in fact been organized precisely on principles of universal and effective freedom in ways that would have been profoundly emancipatory if they had been achieved. And to the extent that we have some of the great achievements of the mid-20th century are a product of those movements. So to the degree that we're suspicious of a kind of paranoid style in American politics, what we're really suspicious of is like the persistent strain of ethno-nationalist sentiment that defines American democracy. And then the second point, which is none of this stuff is populist at all, you know, and and this has to do with uh, obviously like the structural features of the American political project, which is we have a constitution that's profoundly counter-majoritarian and anti-democratic. What it means is that it's not the situation that majoritarian democracy is what produced the outcomes that we find most troubling right now. Majoritarianism didn't lead to Trump. It was actually the ways in which a small minority can end up exercising extreme power. Obviously, you can think of this in terms of the fact that like Trump lost the actual majority vote, but in a more systematic way, you can think of the tools by which the Republican Party has used the anti-democratic features of our own constitutional system, from gerrymandering in the House to the unbalanced nature of popular representation in the Senate to the unelected nature of the judiciary to the fact that the state level is able to like systematically disenfranchise poor and especially marginalized communities of color to produce the conditions we have. Like we're living under circumstances of minority reaction to transformations in the society. And there's a profound way in which the return of this argument against populism participates in a deeply flawed reading of what led to fascism in the 20th century. Fascism in the 20th century in places like Germany and elsewhere did not come about through majority tyranny. It came about through the capacity of empowered minorities. Here, I don't mean you know racial minorities. I mean just in terms of numbers to be able to take advantage of crises in liberal institutions, to subvert those institutions and claim absolute power. Now, I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen in the U.S., but unless we recognize that the problems of the past were not the problems of mass democracy, we're going to find ourselves justifying all sorts of sort of nostalgic status quo politics. We're going to think, oh man, weren't the Obama years so fantastic or the Bush years? Those were the halcyon days when actually those were periods of profoundly limited political solutions being presented to drastic and extreme social, economic, and foreign policy problems. And a large part of why we are where we are now is because of the real failures of the kind of post-political frameworks presented by both Bushes, Clinton, Obama, etc. Aziz Rana, thank you so much for engaging in this conversation from settlement to, to Trump. It's been expansive and extremely interesting. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. Aziz Rana is a professor at Cornell Law and the author of The Two Faces of American Freedom. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. 
as marks once etched into a public restroom stall. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting two new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis, music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our postmaster general is Christian Tyler. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio, and please find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe. And if it's on iTunes, please leave us a review. Those reviews help introduce us to new listeners, and that is a good thing. Also good is telling your friends about the show in real life and on social media. All propaganda on our behalf is greatly appreciated. And find us on Patreon.com and make a monthly contribution. We need them to keep this thing going. Thanks. Thanks.